Hi. <laughs> Welcome to Two Non-Doctors. I'm Liz Mealy. I'm Maria Shahada. And we're in London. We're in the same room. Together. Oh. Um, how you doing, Cupcake? I'm fine. Uh, yeah, everything's good. Uh, yeah. Just swinging my earrings around. <laughs> um, we're in the middle, not the middle, we're in the beginning of our European tour. We did Edinburgh. We did Dublin. We did London. Um, and tomorrow we're leaving for Berlin. And I think I had my first full night's rest. So I'm like, oh, good. Yeah. And I'm two really cups of coffee. Though. So I'm like, that, 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 that. <laughs> <laughs> rested and over caffeinated. And she's like, cool. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. I'm very tired. I don't know why I cannot recoup, but um... especially since you're not jet lagged. No, I know. That's okay. Fine. Yeah. I know you're a superstar and I'm. I'm a whiny bitch, but <laughs> You're like I got 17 hours of sleep. I'm not really sure why I'm still tired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's going to be fun. So, so this is our like little two day rest period and then we're off off to Europe. We're already in Europe. Great. Um, <laughs> it's so funny because we were in Edinburgh and like you have a little bit more of a full picture of Edinburgh because of doing the festival more than I have and your boyfriend. Johnny's from Edinburgh. So I've been yeah. to Edinburgh for non-comedic reasons. Yeah. So I don't have the same trauma still <laughs> as you do. <laughs> I truly, it was because I hadn't been there in eight years. I, the only time I had been there was for the festival. So I was there for a month. It's so weird to go somewhere you've never been for a month for work in truly one of the most chaotic scenarios. It, I, I, it's got to be how somebody like gets a play in New York City and they've never been there before. Or like if you yeah. get cast for SNL and you've never been in like your first day on the job, you're like, oh, God. Um, I was just like, oh, this is such a pretty place without comedians. <laughs> it <is. laughs> but it's not littered with flyers and. Oh, and egos, just egos everywhere. Just it, yeah. it's sadness because like people are like trying to get people in and losing money and stressed and tired. And you're just I mean, it. I called it like comedy boot camp, and there was so many creative and emotional growth like things that came out of that experience. But I also never want to do it again. The same way that like I've learned things from a breakup, but it's also like I would like to not have my heart ripped out of my chest again because like um, it didn't feel good. <laughs> yeah. It's like when you get like a major surgery that like changes your life, but you're like, I don't want to ever have to do that again. Yeah, but like with love, like you're going to do that again. That's just, it's just going to happen. Sure. But like, I hope my boyfriend doesn't break my heart. Right. But like, course. if he does, I've experienced it before. The same way, like bombing doesn't feel good, but I know how to get through it because I've done it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was good. It was, um, I'm glad I, I'm glad I went back. I felt good about it and it was just really pretty. We, I mean, so far, like, uh, weather wise, we've lucked out. Yeah, weather's been really nice. Um, people were really nice. Met a lot of great people. And then yeah, so and then we came to London and fucking London show. Man, you guys are the best. <laughs> the best. It was awesome. It was such a great crowd. I love the Bill Murray. Um, I feel comfortable here. Like, I mean, clearly like, you live here, but I, I really do consider London like a second home, especially comedically. I've like grew a lot as a comic coming out here every year for the last 10 years. So it's like a little bit of like, yeah, I mean, I had seven years of stand-up in L.A. that I had to cleanse. <laughs> and I think I've been here almost eight years now, and I'm still not. I haven't gotten the, like, yeah. stink of L.A. stand-up off of me. For sure. <laughs> like, I still really need quite... the confidence boost. Oh, it's because of, I was going to say, like, comedically, no. I feel like you're stronger than ever. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I meant, like, audiences and just how bad the shows were and, like, how you lost all confidence in yourself in L.A. because nobody laughed at anything. Yeah. Or it was just all other comedians in the in the audience. Um yeah. and then you go anywhere else and you're like, oh, I do like stand up and I am funny. <laughs> for, oh, dude, for sure. I mean, that's what Europe was for me, was like I the US tore down my self-esteem that coming out here and the reason I built a fan base out here was because uh, I was like, either I'm wrong or I was born in the wrong place. Mm. And it really was like my success here actually started to what's the word like trickle over to the U S but I just, I like it here. I feel good here. And it's like a treat because I'm only here once a year. So like 
people seem to be grateful, which is, I love that. I love that yeah. feeling. It's nice when people care. They're like, you're in town. That's awesome. And, and you're then, like, but if you lived here, that would all go away. And you're like, yeah. why did I like it here? Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> Dude, every single comic I know that moves to LA goes, I had this incredible week and then I moved yeah. here and I feel like they You're not me. special anymore and no one cares that you're here and you don't get all the bookings you did when you were just here for those two days and you're like, ooh, who's that? Yeah. Um, I, you know, the same thing happens like when you go to visit a city and you're like, I want to move here. And it's like, all right, visiting a city is totally different than getting a job in a city. <laughs> for sure. And then you for find sure. out. where You find out what you really can afford. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, anybody can afford a nice Airbnb for a week and then yeah react. I'm constantly hunched over like I'm just like kind of sorry I just can't stand it and I, I just but I don't want to I don't want to do a podcast like this <laughs> it feels stiff I know but like you know how they have the shoulder Botox shoulder Botox yeah like it's Botox yeah for your shoulders so like I have so never it, heard of that yeah and so it, like kind of elongates your neck a little bit but like these muscles that are just like hunching on, on me right now would like go but isn't that almost contrary because like the whole point is to be like relaxed but up and then you're just kind of like your whole like I know people that wear like the little like almost looks like you have like the police that wear guns like the vest for the guns and it's under their jacket and kind of pushes this yeah back. I need that I need that but I just think at my rest even if I'm even if I'm like sitting straight up, I still have my shoulders just feel like I, I want to try shoulder Botox. That's all I'm saying. It's called Barbie Botox. I can't. Oh. I <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then there's a Cleopatra one. <laughs> there's so many like, like beautifications you can do and it will take all of your money. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you just have to curve For a thing. You nobody has to accept your shoulders are going to be a little hunched. For a thing nobody's worried about. Yeah, yeah, right. But, you know, self-esteem. Sure, but it's it's one thing to notice something, to be insecure about it and, you know, get the potions and do whatever about it. It's another thing for somebody to teach you something about something you didn't know about, right? Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't need that. I don't care about that. I've never thought about that. Right. You know what I mean? Right, it's right. like that kind of thing. As opposed to, like, Oh, like when I was in Dubai, I went to the mall and somebody gave me some eye cream, which it did work on me. I did buy it, but, um, (laughs) Uh but it was amazing transformation. It was like, it was like all the puffiness had just gone away right before my very eyes. (laughs) So like I bought it and it was expensive, but they went, they took me to this other place and she was like, all right, are you worried about all your hyperpigmentation? I was like, don't know what that is. Don't even give a shit about it. And yeah. she's like, okay, but like, let's address your hyperpigmentation. I'm like, I got to tell you, I don't know what that is. I'm not worried about it. And she's yeah. like, right, right. And so she's going along. And then of course it fixes your hyperpigmentation. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is hyperpigmentation? And it's like, she's, she, she put me in this thing and it measured all my little freckles of hyperpigmentation. And she was like, all this. And I was like, I don't I've never see it. I don't care. What was an insecurity <laughs> I had? I still bought it, but um, <laughs> yep, 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 yep. if anybody's trying to sell anything, start with Maria. Yeah, and she is. I'm so ready. susceptible. Like they'll like, talk wa- about commercial. I'm like, I want talk about. <laughs> like I've watched it easy, yeah. in real time. Yeah, in real time. It's gonna be a interesting two weeks, isn't it? Two yeah. Weeks, okay. Yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh. I am because we're going to do another one in the middle of our tour. And I'm so curious as somebody that had two days off and has gotten some rest in the last two days, what this podcast is going to be in a week. Mm. I'm just like, it is funny. Is this we're going to be like choking each other at the beginning? Yeah. "Ah, I'm going to turn. I feel like, I feel like right now we're in the honeymoon phase of this tour. Yeah. And we're going to be like a, Rizzled married couple. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, but we've been there before. It's we've right. we've been married we before. Get it. And we have figured it out. Yeah. We always come back to the basics. Yeah. Which is I love you. Yeah. And but it's gonna be okay. Go home. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we were just we were just telling our friend Amarina, like I feel like I've our friendship has grown and gotten closer because of touring together, because we've been long distance friends for longer than we were not long distance friends and it's like i we know those little you know what i mean like when i'm hungry and i like i'm trying to suppress my anger towards the world and you're like let's fix that let's you know let's get some food or like 
when I'm tired and it's like, hey, I'm shutting down and I don't think I can do this. Like, I feel like we know each other like a married yeah. couple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can sense when you're just like, you, your your energy's run out. I've said something, you've said nothing. <laughs> and I get like, does she even fucking hear me? <laughs> and then you look, at, you look at me and I'm like, and I'm like, like a shell like, of a, she needs a minute and some food. <laughs> yeah. And I obviously do too. <laughs> I'm like, did you even fucking hear me? <laughs> you hand me a cookie and I just come back and I'm like, it's like when you water a plant, like your plant and you're like, they look a little droopy and then you put water and it's like, Ding. yeah, I just spray candy on you. <laughs> now listen to the rest of my story. I have like chalk on my face. I'm like, you said what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's gonna, it's gonna be interesting and an experience. Mm-hmm. And I'm excited for it. Me too. Um, so we should probably give you a heads up. Um, we are, where are we? Um, by the time this comes out, we'll be in Brussels that night. So we're going to be in Brussels tonight, then Amsterdam, Geneva, Zurich, Munich. And then I run off to Istanbul on uh, the 26th. And you can come see us. Come see us. Everything's Um, uh, Hopefully there's still some tickets left. Uh, check the website. But um yeah. And then if you haven't seen my special murder sheets, go watch murder sheets. It's free on YouTube. I'm very proud of it. And I think that's it. Uh, great. Um, well then let's, um, what do we do now? Announcement? No, we did announcements. Follow us. Yeah. Uh, at two non doctors it's <laughs> on Twitter and YouTube. It's at two non doctors, number two, full word doctors on Instagram. It's at two non DRS. I'm at Maria Shahada, at Liz Mealy. And then Patreon is patreon.com slash two, the number two, non, and then forward doctors. And thank you to all our Patreons, our thank patrons. You. Patrons, thank yeah. you, patrons. You've been, you're doing great. We're very appreciative. Thank you so much for supporting us. It truly means a lot. Yeah. And um, let me get into it. Yeah, so I think we're going to do like a let's get personal, which is what are you reading? What are you reading? Um, I'm just happy I'm reading again, if I'm being honest. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you used to read a lot, like a I, lot. I did. I mean, like, you know, I've talked about being dyslexic. I am a very slow reader, but I, for somebody, I think for even an average adult that isn't a slow reader, I used to read more. You know what I mean? Like I used to read more than the average person. I would read anywhere from a book, depending on the size of the book, I'd read a book every two to three weeks. Um, and then I was down to like once a month. And then I was down to like maybe 10 books a year. And man, in this last did audiobooks take over or is it just no, not even I don't like audiobooks because I have I don't I barely like podcasts. I kind of go through podcast phases and I have a hard time concentrating um with podcasts and actually absorbing the information. Reading for some reason, reading is so hard for me and I have to reread stuff that I actually retain information better. Um and um and, and it take in the like I just I do better with reading in the sense if I'm trying to both either pleasurably enjoy a novel or taking in academic like things I just do better with reading mm. um the only time podcasts or like an audiobook would help I have to pause a lot sometimes I'll have to write stuff down yeah but in between the breaks it would be like I would call you up and be like I'm reading this thing and I would say it to you so by regurgitating what I learned to multiple ple people Cause like I, I listened to a podcast, yes. um, we, we regret to inform you. It's an, a re rejection podcast. Loved it. I listened to like three or four episodes and I loved it so much that this one episode I to told like four of my friends about it. And that's why I retained that specific episode. But like, there's a couple of things I liked it, but I told nobody about it. And yeah. I'm the same to retain. First I have to see it. So I'm like a very visual learner and then I have to like tell people about it. And then I realize where all the gaps in my knowledge are. I'm like, okay, obviously like it was really good, but um, there was two people and I forget what they're, obviously I didn't read it. <laughs> you yeah, have to go back. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's even like when it comes to stand up, people are like, how do you memorize an hour? And you're like, first of all, it's done in chunks. Mm -hmm. I wrote it. It's written down. I do it every single night. It's chunks. Then it becomes memorized and then it has an order and then whatever. And it becomes like this, this entity or whatever, but it's, it's the repetition. You know yeah. what I mean? And even in the beginning, when I'm still thinking about it, I'm telling you about it. I'm like, I have this idea and da, 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 da. So, I mean, I wish my dad always read a lot. He's dyslexic as well, always read a lot. And now he does audiobooks. like he drives a ton. So my dad is reading, however you describe it, physical books and audiobooks, probably like four or five a month. 
And I yeah. think that really, cause my dad loves taking in information, but, um, he'll sometimes love an audiobook so much that he'll physically read it because he wants to absorb it more fully. Right. Yeah. But I'm not going to do that. Okay. Fair enough. So fair enough. There's definitely audiobooks that I'm like, this is so interesting. I have to actually buy it so I can see it and like yeah. remember it. But, and then I know I don't. Yeah. There's so much information to take in in the world. There's so much. Um, I had to read something in like three days because I was going to do this like, um, trailer for not like a podcast, but a radio for, uh, it's, it's another, one of my agent's clients ideas. And they were like, why don't you co-host this? So I read a book in there. It was a graphic novel. Like he was like, all right, let's go easy. And I found it was fun home, you know, fun home, like mm -hmm. the Alison Bechtel, you know, the Bechtel test. Yes. So Alison Bechtel wrote fun home, which was, a, it was a graphic novel that became a solo show. But um, so it was like, oh, a graphic novel, that'll be easy. But they're they're actually a little more dense, I think, than novels, because like you read the the words, but then you also look at the pictures and then the way she did it was like the pictures all had like all kinds of information, like like full things written out within the picture. And so you're reading it. So it slowed up, it slowed down the whole reading process. I don't think I like graphic novels. Oh, so I, funny. I'm thinking about writing one. I know. <laughs> I know you saw that. And I was like, I'm going to have so to I've been pretend reading I've read my best friend's book. <laughs> <laughs> but totally just, you know, just look covers, you know, each chapter, look at the main picture. Um, we'll get back to graphic novels. Continue. Yeah, no, it's just it was just because I, it just slowed down the flow of me taking in the information because I'm like reading it, looking at the pictures and then the, the boxes were at different places. So I'm like, wait, do I read this box, this box and this box or this box, this box and this box? And I, I just didn't like it, you know, and plus like the visuals were nice, but I would have been fine visualizing it on my own. Yeah, but it was really good and um, really dense. Uh, and then she, she had so many literary references in it that I was like, I get it. You went to school. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, I feel like that, that book deserves another read and I have to go and read all the references she mentioned and then come back and read it again. And you read the dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so what yeah. are you reading right now? Oh, right. Um, okay. So I haven't actually just got it today. Um, but it's, um, I feel like we're doing show and tell. I love this games. People play. Uh, by Eric Byrne. So I I had uh, one th therapy session with somebody. I really like him so far. And uh, he sent me some links to some things. But one is, um, it was a YouTube video about like transactional analysis. And so th there's a lot to go into and I'm going to skip it all. But basically what, what, what caught my attention was this like this whole game that people play where like say person A asks person B, um, I have this problem and I don't know what to do. And then person B goes, oh, why don't you do this? And then person A goes, yeah, but I can't do this for this reason. And so that happens a few times. So person B goes, okay, have you tried this? Yeah, that doesn't work because of this. And then, have you tried this? Yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. Okay, well, I'm out of ideas. And then person A is like, okay, well, I guess you're not very helpful. <laughs> Holy shit. So, I mean, but have you not been in that dynamic? Oh, of, of course, of course, like, of course. Like that person, like nothing you say is like what they want to hear because they don't actually want advice. They want to be heard. They want attention and they want justification for their inaction. So the game is not the surface thing is that two adults are talking about problem solution. But the game is that one person wants attention and, um, and like, what ends up happening is they feel justified and um, uh, what have I written down? They feel justified and something I can't read that I've written in there. In, oh, and, it, and justified in their inaction. I can't do this because this. So like all the things you said, I can't do. So I'm okay not doing anything about it. And then it makes the person B who's trying to help feel de-skilled and foolish. Yeah. Um, and then so like, it's like if you're person B to get out of it, you might go. So they say, I have a problem. And if you give a solution, they're like, no, then you go, okay, well, what do you think you're going to do about it? Oh, interesting. You know, that's like one way to get out of this, this sort of thing, but like, it's also about recognizing it in the first place. For sure. And I think, you know, one thing that I learned in therapy, because I was raised by my dad, I'm very much a guy in the sense that like, if you tell me you have a problem, I'm like, you should do this or this or this or this or this, that as, especially as somebody that's divergent thinking. Which I accept a parental ego state, according to this transactional analysis business. For sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was raised that way. And I feel I like being helpful. I like helping others. And it wasn't probably until Nitika who flat out looked at me and was just like, I just want you to listen. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, 
Okay. Like almost like gave me a task because I clearly needed to do something. And I was always like, the task is helping. And she was like, no, 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 your task is listening. And I was like, okay, I can do that. Oh my God. There's a, like an incredible, like a classic scene from White Men Can't Jump where Rosie Perez tells Woody Harrelson's character. Cause she's like, if I tell you I'm thirsty, I don't want you to get me a glass of water. I want you to say, I too know what it's like to be thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what you and Nitika, that's the conversation. Yeah, 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 which I don't actually agree with. If I say I'm thirsty, I want you to go get me a fucking glass of water because yeah. I would do the same thing for you. But everybody's different, blah, blah, blah. And so she was the first person that was like, hey, can you just listen? So then with her, I'd be like, she would tell me something. I go, do you want me to just listen? Mm -hmm. And she'd be like, yeah. Or sometimes she'll be like, can you tell me what, what you do? Would <laughs> yeah, do? Truly. And so it's like this. So when I started dating my boyfriend, I remember like I was in a really difficult situation, like a month into us dating. And I was even like scared just to tell him because it was like, I don't, this feels like a lot and I don't want to put that on you and I don't need you to do anything. So I very much was like talking around it and he's listening and he's about to say something. He goes, do you want me to just listen or do you want solutions? And I was like, I think I first need you to listen. And then after that, I'll let you know if I need solutions. So it's both on me to know what I want, which some people don't even know what, that they want someone to listen. So yeah. that, even there that takes some self-awareness, but on top of it, the other person being able to accept what I want, right? Yeah. Because I've told my dad, hey, I just want you to listen. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like 10 minutes in, he's like, well, duh, what, eh, and you, yeah. and I'm like, dad. And he's like, what, I'm listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, there's a, that's a form of it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In your own, in your own unique way, you are technically listening. Yeah. Um. But it took me, that took me a long time because my dad raised me. It took me a long time to learn that. And I still, just sit back and yeah. And Johnny and I, does the same thing. He's like, do you want to help or you want to listen? And I'm like, you know, usually I want help. Usually. If you could just fix it, that would be you do, it. Yeah, you, you do it. Yeah. You do it. Here's my life. If you could just. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so what is this book about the, the games? So those play? sorts of games, like this, like transactional analysis and games that like the things that people do that it's like on the surface, it's about one thing, but underneath it's about another. So I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I just got it in the mail today. So I haven't started Kurt, Kurt reading it. Vonnegut is like, yeah. yeah. Brilliant, amusing, and clear catalog of the psychological theatricals that human beings play over and over again. Kurt Vonnegut. Look, I love this stuff. I love like these sort of, um, like the dynamics between people and then, and just, you know, Johnny like always sees me gets like, get like in a, in a party, I'll get like really annoyed with somebody and he'll be like, you're annoyed. Yeah. Shut up. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> and then he'll be like, what, like what I'm like, they're so obviously just, they just want attention. And that's all they would, you know, like, yeah. I don't know. I can't think of a specific example, but yeah. it's just like, but in comedy, it's, it's like, I can see these things that like, yeah. I know what's really going on. I'm not saying I'm the only one who can do it, but like, no, 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 off. of course. So I just thought it'd be fun to read something like um, definitive about that, about that. Cause I've never, I've never come across anything like this. So did your therapist recommend it? Yeah. He sent me like eight videos after our first session. Oh, yeah. That. Yeah. 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 That is such like, talk about feeling attuned and heard when somebody's yes. like, Hey, this is, I don't know if this is the right path, but this is what I'm hearing. And these might be extra tools yep. outside the hour I can give you. And then from there, like, it's like, I think that was like so important in the beginning of my therapy journey is that my therapist either gave me physical homework to do or told me about like books and stuff, or even just like the games we play, like that, like, the, like a, like a theory or a, a device yeah. or whatever. Yeah. That, that's so helpful. Yeah, definitely. What, um, what are you reading? Okay. So I'm technically in the middle of three books. Um, <laughs> and this is the thing, because I've been very conscious about getting back into reading, I, was doing research for a script I was thinking about turning into a book. So the script is done, but I was thinking about expanding it and turning it into a book. And I wanted the addition to the script and the book, I wanted um, to learn, I wanted to add something about the, the, the mafia in the sixties. And so I wanted to learn about the history of the mafia and how they work. So how Fun. to understand how my character would interact with them yeah. because she's a woman in the sixties that owns a business. So she's already an anomaly in that time. And then you have the mafia, who in the sixties that are at the height of their, um, power. Um, and, um, so I, I'm 
It's an 800 page book called Five Families. And it's mm -hmm. about the five major um, uh, Italian families in New York, like the New York mafia. But what I liked about it is it talked about all the different mafias because they're all over the place. But then, you know, the New York ones and it gives the history from like the 20s. I'm actually in like the 60s right now. And what's funny about it is it was so big, like it was so big that um, I had my dad split it into four books. Cause I didn't, I know I'm a slow reader and I didn't want to carry it around. So, he, and my dad was like, you can't do that. <laughs> I go, why can't I do that? He goes, cause of the author. And I go, I bought his goddamn book. He got my money. He, yeah. Not only did he get my money, I'm reading it and I'm excited about it. And I'm telling other people about it. Yeah. I am your target audience. Fuck. You. It's like when somebody's like to dog, you the book is disrespectful to the author. Yeah. Hey, but I'm reading it. People don't read anymore. Eat a dick. Yeah. And I know this is my dad talking for the author, but it made, he was like, he literally was like, I can't do that. I was like, that's crazy. Cause you asked me how you could help me. And I'm telling you, cut this in four <laughs> and make a cover. He splits it in four squares. You're like, no, no, I did that every time. <laughs> uh, that's a flip time. book. <laughs> so I'm, I'm in the middle of the second book. So I'm like, you know, 300 pages in and it's good. And it's not that it's not good, but like, I could tell that I needed something else. And then again, I was thinking about turning, maybe I was going to turn it into a graphic novel or I have another script. I was thinking about turning into a graphic novel. And my brother's been trying to get me to read this graphic novel for forever. And it's called Saga. It's so good. It's all sex and violence. So good. Um, to the point where like, kind of like some of the imagery is graphic and I'm on the subway and it's cartoons. But yeah, you're like, like, oh God. You're like, oh God. <laughs> Sorry. It's, like, it's like when you're on the plane and the sex scene comes on and you're and like, you're like, <laughs> you're like <laughs> trying to like avert the eyes. Of <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I'm not related, but it still makes me uncomfortable. Um, so it's, it's like, well, but it's really, really good. And what's actually funny about that is I, I really loved it. And I'm like, this is as a million books. So I'm like five chat and they look very skinny, but I'm in chapter five. And of course, my brother's like, are you at the part at the da-da-da? I was like, see me, stop it. Yeah. Dude, I don't know. And, yeah. and then it's like the next page. And I was like, God damn. Um, <laughs> but um, I really love the author, love the artist. So I followed the artist. I followed the author. The author follows me back. Nice. And I was like, oh. and so I wrote to him. I was just was like, hey, I am just started Saga. I'm very late. My brother's been telling me to read it forever. It's really great. I'm a big fan. And he's like, I've heard you on Bennington. You're awesome. Um, That's your great. brother also sounds awesome. And That's I was great. like, bah, bah, bah. <laughs> um, so Saga is really good. Highly recommend it. Just I also I love the um the cutting it up into four because I know it's just to travel, but also like like I watched uh, all of Michelle Wolf's special because it was like twenty minutes each, and I don't think I would have sat through an hour. I, it's rare that I sit through an hour comedy special. I'm not trying Why to like this her specifically. Each? They just cut it up into twenty minute sections, so it was like on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. So. I don't so it's like, yeah, so it was like an hour um, special, but it was like 20 minute episodes. And I ended up watching the whole thing. So it's like, cause it's in chunks. <laughs> I don't know why it's just more. Digestible. And it does help to definitively be like, oh, look, I love a good end. Cause like 800 pages is like, well, yeah, I'll finish this in four years. Yeah. I still might finish it in four years, but it seems like I finished two books so far. Exactly. Yeah. That's so awesome. So I didn't, I was still reading Saga. I'm still in, invested in Saga, but I didn't want to bring like six books right with me and then have to carry the books. So I was like, let me bring a book just for this tour. So the book I just started on the plane, I'm like 50 pages in it's called hidden, hidden potentials by Adam Grant. I'm a huge Adam Grant fan. Adam. Um, I love, I, I follow his Instagram cause all his posts are like bite size. He's so, he's such a dense writer that like he writes something and I'll read it like 50, like just one line, I'll read it like 15 times. And I'm just like, Jesus Christ. Like it's so much is just, he's such an incredible writer and thoughtful, but I got into him probably like 12 years ago. Cause he wrote a book called give and take, which is about um, um, uh, the, the pros and cons of being a giver, honestly. And his whole thesis was um, there's givers, takers and matchers. So clearly a giver gives more than they take. A taker takes more than they give and a matcher is tit for tat. And his thing was like, who do you think is the least successful? And he was like, givers. And he's like, well, who do you think is the most successful? Also givers. And the whole book is to explain why givers are both the least successful and the most successful. Mm -hmm. And it was a life, it was game changing. As somebody that likes giving, as somebody that that takes a lot of pride in helping people, I was at a point where I was like, I was raised to be like this. I like being like this, but I'm tired. I feel taken advantage of. I'm angry. I'm resentful. And I was in a place that I was like, I feel like being a giver is a detriment and I think I might not do it anymore. And like truly on this like crossroads and he like taught me how to be a better giver and it changed my life, like genuinely changed my life. And it's really about like now we have the language of like boundaries and, and what have you, but it really made me understand 
How to not A, get taken advantage of by takers. How to identify them, not get taken advantage of them. And then even with being a giver, how to not give so much of yourself that you you literally have nothing left for anybody else or, or even yourself. So it was like truly a game changer. So this book, my dad actually got me this for Christmas. And it's funny because I gave my dad give and take. He gave me another Adam Grant book that I hadn't read yet. And then this. Why is that? How is that? What is that thumbs up? Why did it do that? I don't know. That was so weird. Do you think they saw it? Did you guys see our thumbs up in our video? Um, so weird. Um, <laughs> creepy. Um, but um, did I do a thumbs up? That's what I wonder. Okay. okay. Um, but but this uh, hidden potential um, is basically kind of um think of it in the same realm as um oh who's the guy that does all the the books the um he's the one the 10,000 hours and Ma Malcolm Gladwell Malcolm Gladwell so he's kind of like a Malcolm Gladwell type where he's like a researcher think like a Brene Brown uh Malcolm Gladwell in the sense that he does these research he finds these stories and he tells you anecdotal stories that match the research so you understand how you too can be successful or you too can be happy or whatever the, the thesis is, whatever it is. So this is about how you can reach uh, um, more potential by understanding um, kind of the core, um, the core goal. So like being successful, it's just like, well, that's such an arbitrary um, uh, word and especially everybody's definition of su successful is different. So he kind of opens up the book talking about how these, um, uh, what do you call it? Like, a, uh, it's like this chess tournament and, um, you know, some of the smartest, best kids in the world are at this chess tournament. And then in walks these like five kids from Harlem that they're not from a private school and they didn't, they haven't been doing chess since they were three and blah, blah, blah. And they like sweep it. Like they, is this from outliers? This is, I think it might also be from outliers because okay. I remember the story. Um, but this is how he opens it. And he basically talks about that coach, like that that guy and and how while all the other, you know, chess teachers are talking about, um, you know, strategy, memorizing stuff, getting ahead, da, 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 his was about composure and 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 um, not getting startled and what the goal is and, and blah, blah, blah. So like when things didn't pan out, these kids were like you could they were like chess, they were like uh, poker players, like you couldn't read them. And even like he gave an example that one kid ended up crying when he lost. And when he found out he was crying, he found out because he let his team down because it was all about the team. And it was like the only emotion he had wasn't that he he messed up. It was like he let his team down. Yeah. But it was like it, it was just like a perfect opening. But it's just about um, I don't know. I think right now I'm in a. Unhappy change in my career um, because things are shifting um, in a bunch of different ways. And I have had any, everybody, especially in the artistic world goes through this. And I think even the world with the pandemic and there's been all this stuff, but like for us as artists, like between the pandemic and all the strikes, the actor strike and the writer strike, it really shook things up in a way that there's been some positives, but there's been a ton of negatives and it's, it's even more fragile being an artist feels even more fragile than it ever has before. And it's changing like it has before. And I feel like my agent and my manager are living in the nineties. I feel like financially people are like paying you like it's the nineties, but everything is 2024 prices and everything. It's like the exchange rate. I've been calling yeah. it like, like creative inflation. Like I just feel like my following doesn't read the same amount. And I feel like my accolades don't read the same amount. And it, like nothing, I, I feel like I'm going to buy you eggs. Mean, you say your following doesn't read the same amount. You're saying the because you have a following that doesn't have the same impact as it might have three years ago. Right. Okay. Because it sounds like you're saying my following doesn't read. <laughs> no, my following has no reading. And that's why we're talking about books. I really would like <laughs> Please, people guys, to learn to read. It up. Yeah. No, well, the next episode is I'm going to do ABCs. Um, yeah. It's just like, like, think of it this way, like, um, and maybe this is a little insider baseball, but like if I appeared on Letterman 10 years ago, that's a big credit, but Letterman's been off the air for years. And to say you've been on Letterman is kind of like, cool. So 10 years ago, you were on a show that show doesn't exist anymore. What have you done today? And it seems like the same thing where it's just like, hey, I, um, I have all these followings. This is a big deal. And they're like, sure. 
but this is actually not enough anymore. You actually have to have this many followers for us to even talk to you. And you're like, but it used to be this much. And they're like, that's nothing now. That's like being invisible. And you're like, oh, I was really proud of myself. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, okay. I don't know. So I'm, there's, there's a huge shift that's going on, not only personally, but I think in the business and changes need to be made. And I think this is universal in everybody's business, but I have to make changes. It's hard and scary and frustrating. And this is kind of like the perfect book for me to read. What's it called again? Hidden Potential. All right. Because it's hidden. I don't know where my potential is, guys. <laughs> um, We're going to be looking for it in Europe. Yeah. Um, please come to our hidden potential at these, these, these dates. Um, but no, I'm, I feel I forgot. Like I genuinely, I knew that I missed reading, but I knew I was too tired to like, fo I couldn't even watch TV shows at one point. I was just so tired. So I'm like, I was reading on the plane and I felt so good. Like, it's, yeah, it's so I've never read even a novel. I've never read even something that doesn't like teach me anything and not been like, it fills you up. It's like, it's like when you go to a spa and you're just like, I'm better now. Yeah. 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 That's great. Um, was there a third one you said you were reading? Oh no. So it was the five, the five families mafia book. I'm in the middle, the saga graphic novel. Cause I'm thinking about turning oh, okay. something into a graphic novel. Oh, what was I going to say about the graphic novel? I was going to come back to it. I can't remember, mm. but highly recommend five families, highly recommend saga. And then I'm already, like I said, 50 pages into hidden potential and Adam Grant in general, follow him on Instagram and give and take truly one of the best books I've ever read ever. He's just a great writer. Oh, I do want to read this like, quote. like this was like, I read this to you and I was like, this is a game changer. Um, not a game changer. It just like was so fucking well put, but he said, if personality is how you respond on a typical day, character is how you show up on a hard day. And I was like, Oh yeah, Adam. <laughs> oh yeah. I just love, I fucking love that stuff. So it was, I don't know. I just, everything I read. So when you go off on someone who does you an injustice, like in all of your jokes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's you. That's your character. That's my personality. <laughs> but no, and but my like, character is just hungry. <laughs> no, but like, I actually think this, so your person is how you respond on a typical day. So if somebody cuts me off in traffic, it's like, go fuck yourself. I'll kill your family. Mm. But like on a hard day, let's say, you know, um, I don't know. I found out my mother is sick and I have to cancel my gigs and, you know, go take care of my mom. It's just like, I do what it takes and I get into business mode and I'm there for her because it's important and she's important. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's just like, Yes, I might be kind of a crazy bitch in traffic and I'm going to yell at you and tell you to die, but but I know who I am. I know I know who I am as a person. I'm not a bad person. I yell, I'll tell everybody to die in a fire, but the truth of the matter is is if I saw a car crash in front of me, I'd park my car and make sure that person's okay. Like, you know what I mean? Like die in a fire and then I see a fire, I'm like, "Oh my god, I I wish it." So like, I got to watch what I say. <laughs> So I don't know. I, 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 and I, we've talked about it, especially when we started our podcast, I've always loved self-help, but I've gotten away from, I don't just need somebody to be like, it's going to be okay. I want somebody to give me tools and skills and kind of build. And I don't, I no longer need that. Like you're awesome. And here's how, you know, like, it's like, I'm beyond that. Yeah. I'm beyond f first year of therapy. I'm in 10 years of therapy. So I'm beyond like, it's going to be okay. But like, how and give me some skills and things are changing. Can you give me examples of what to do differently? So. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. This is fun. Yeah. All right. Next one, we're going to probably be in Europe when we record. So that's cool. Yeah. We're, we're in Europe right now. I love it so much that you don't identify where you are as Europe. 2016 Brexit. I don't know. <laughs> I think it feels like <laughs> it's are been in Europe? eight years of us not being in Europe. So yeah, I feel yeah. like I adjusted. Maybe you didn't, but yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? It's, are we in Europe, guys? I don't know. I'm, we don't know. We don't know. But uh, okay. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.